Welcome back to the Fullerton College Pre-Press class. This is your instructor, Ben Kewitt, and we're taking our third look at the Pre-Press Trainees Manual by PIA, Section 3.3, Digital File Formats. Today we're starting with the TIFF, or the TIFF, depending on how many letters your computer lets you use in your extensions. Both are the same thing, in the same way that JPEG can have an E in it or not. <clears throat> so, the TIFF is the purest of pixel images. The TIFF shows you exactly what the sensor on the camera or scanner saw and sends it right on to you. It does not try to compress it or make it fit into a smaller file than it is, although they tend to be compact in general because they are well, they have a different type of compression, to be honest, uh, which is more of a lookup system, kind of like a paint by number, where instead of rem remembering every single square and what color it is, the computer simply remembers all the colors in the picture and assigns each one a number and only remembers the color once. So instead of remembering 64 bits of data for color for each individual pixel, it only has to remember 64 bits of data for each individual color used and just creates a small lookup chart that it will then say, okay, I use this color here, this color here, this color here. Again, like a paint by number. Anyways, <clears throat> they do not support everything, but they're pretty good. They don't do duotones and tritones. In fact, it's hard to get a file format that does that. You kind of need an EPS or some specific versions of uh, a PDF. Uh, can also sometimes support those strange color spaces where you are using non-primary ink colors as your ink colors, which makes them outside the CMYK gamut entirely and are composed specifically only of spot color. Um, they do support, however, CMYK, RGB, lab color, index color, grayscale, and bitmap. That does mean that if you get a TIFF, you need to check out to see what kind of color space it's using, because it could be any of those. Um, let's take a look for a moment at a TIFF close up so you can see what I'm talking about, because trying to describe image quality is not doing you much of a service, now is it? So here's a TIFF of a color gamut spread out, kind of like how you have a flat projection of the Earth's round globe to make a flat map. This is a flat map of a color gamut. And this is done in TIFF format. So if we zoom in on this, you can see in these beautiful gradients that every pixel is intuitively what you expect it to be. That is what a TIFF does. Every single spot in here, this whole gradient is built out of tiny squares of color next to each other, each square in this image is a different color. Each square is next to the other squares, and it all blends very smoothly together with very small changes. Um, because again, I'm some sort of sadist, let's switch over and look at this in JPEG. Oof, why would we do that? Here's the same image in JPEG. Of course, it's saved it in a lower compression, or sorry, a lower file size, greater compression, to show you the difference, because sometimes you have to enlarge that serial to show texture on the box front, don't you? But you can see in here clearly that it's made of these meta squares, these larger tiles of those 64 pixels at a time, all trying to be their own thing. And it just doesn't quite have the same level of smooth, whoops, smoothness, my hand slipped off the space bar there, that the TIFF does. Let's go back, let's end on a good note here. Ooh, TIFF, so smooth, so nice. Same resolution, same number of pixels, but when every pixel is assigned its own value, according to what the sensor saw, you get a much cleaner transition between things than you do when you're taking averages. Those averages really show up on the two extremes. The first one was from our JPEGery video where you saw the extremes of sharp edge contrast getting lost to JPEGs. And over here, you see the difference where smooth gradations also disappear in the JPEG because anytime you need a specific color tile to be in a specific place, JPEG, by just kind of remembering a general hazy remembrance of the thing is not going to give you this level of precision. The PNG is the Portable Network Graphic. It, it also uses compression. Uh, there's lossless. Remember that lossy compression, like JPEG, means the computer is making it smaller by forgetting parts of it. Lossless compression means it's making it smaller by organizing the data better to make it smaller. Similar to the the TIFF, the PNG sometimes uses LZW compression, which involves lookup charts and figuring out what colors are used and making sure to reference them and rather than trying to save each pixel individually, 
yeah, it's, it's, it's more efficient, but it doesn't forget anything. JPEG says, yeah, you know, this whole area is fine. Let's just use this whole area as long as it adds up to about the same color. So anyways, a PNG is designed for web use. Uh, they're commonly used on the internet, although nowadays there's also a new file format called the WebP for WebPic or something that keeps showing up. And I need to find some better systems on my computer that can deal with it. There are plugins you can get for Photoshop to allow you to open them, but otherwise it's a bit of a steel wall dropping between you and playing with imagery you found online. So beware the WebP. So the PNG being designed for network use and only for computer viewing does not support other color spaces. It only supports those that are important to internet viewing, which are RGB, of course, indexed color, which we may not talk about too much now, but is an interesting thing that you run into sometimes. Indexed color was just a way of really reducing the amount of information necessary to show color by really reducing the color you show. Grayscale and bitmap, those are all things that you might see on a website. And before you think you're not gonna run into index, I ran into index by accident in the middle of a variable data class a few years ago. I tried to do a Photoshop change to it and all the colors didn't work because apparently they didn't exist inside that index color space. Weird. So PNG, good for internet, not so great for printing, although it'll do okay. Modern color management systems and modules do an okay job translating RGB color to CMYK color in a somewhat predictable and acceptable manner. Also, the PNG, I should mention, even though this curriculum does not, the PNG is popular because it supports transparency. You can have a PNG with a clipping mask in it that has no background. That's one of the reasons they're popular and come to us uh, in prepress from clients often who like it for the transparent background, not realizing it's still not quite meant for print. That said, I've had a good amount of success using these in professional print jobs. They turn out okay. But if anyone's a real stickler on their color, this may cause problems. The BMP is the Windows knockoff version of the TIFF. That's right, I said knockoff. In the same way that Arial is the Windows knockoff of Helvetica. They really wanted in on it, but Apple wasn't inviting them. So they said, we'll make our own. And it's basically the same thing, done basically the same way. Um, but I agree wholeheartedly with the PIA on this one. BMPs aren't always compatible. Although they do the same job to the same level as a TIFF, the fact that not all programs accept them is a good reason to try to avoid them. If you get one and you're allowed to, uh, you'll have to talk to the client on this, find a way of converting it to a TIFF because it'll save you a lot of trouble because somewhere in your print shop, there's that one machine you didn't realize that doesn't like BMPs. So be careful there. BMP does RGB indexed grayscale and bitmap. You'll notice it does not involve lab color or CMYK color. So it doesn't have the same robust color management uh, support that the TIFF does as well. Another reason not to use them. Uh, the main one really is compatibility. Uh, most people are willing to accept slight differences in color quality on their print jobs. They're not willing to accept a picture not being there. Windows Metafile, WMFs. These are a strange Windows version of kind of a PDF. I have not yet run into one in the wild. Uh, that doesn't mean they don't exist because once you are pretty sure that something's not there, that's when the ROS ROUS pounces you out of the swamp. Uh, so I'm not gonna say they don't exist, but I have not run into one. Um, these ones are similar to PDFs in that they're not really editable. They come, they're no longer in a native file version. They come out and uh, they contain the vector and they contain the pixel and they contain the text, but they would cause some compatibility issues and it's easier to translate in a natural like AI or InDesign file format from Windows to Mac than it is to get a WMF file to work somewhere else. This is just one of those warnings. This is one of those digital boogeymen you have to watch out for. Because in the night when you think you're safe, your closet door creaks open and out walks a Windows metafile and you can't print it and you wake up in a cold sweat. Don't ask me how I know this. Ah, here we go. The best file. I'm not impartial. This is the portable document format, the PDF. We've already looked at a whole chapter of this. So we don't need to go into too much detail right now other than remember that they do a lot of things. They work on all computers. 
they work in cross applications. Multiple different types of programs can open, place, and use, and even edit sometimes PDFs. It's based off of PostScript, but it's not PostScript. It's a more efficient version of PostScript that works better on computers and on printers than actual PostScript. In fact, many RIPs, raster image processors, and plate makers now prefer PDF over PostScript. It does a better job of maintaining formatting, positioning, colors, images, text, everything you need for a good print job is all contained in a PDF. Even though it was never meant to do this, it's the chosen one. And you know, I don't even like chosen one narratives, but I'll say it about this one. It is the chosen one. There are a lot of different versions. Uh, this has continued on. <laughs> this uh, curriculum only talks about up to Acrobat 8. There's uh, several more Acrobats since then with different versions. Each one has its own version of the PDF available. They're all backwards compatible. So you can use, on the newest version of Acrobat, you can use up to the oldest version of PDF without trouble. But if you're somehow running an older reader or an older Acrobat, you may have trouble with newer files. They are backwards compatible, but they're not time travelers. The ISO, the International Standards Organization, has taken over from Adobe on maintaining the PDF. It is no longer a proprietary file type that's owned by a company. Now it's in the public domain and people can make their own versions. New versions of, of PDFs are being built by not Adobe. One of my very favorites is the PDF slash VT, which involves variable data being able to be compressed, multiple records worth of information compressed into smaller amounts of space using compression similar to MPEG-4, but we're not gonna go into all that right now. PC at PDF is open specification. Anyone can write these things if they know how to do it. Any programmer is welcome to it, and if it's good, it'll get accepted by the ISO and put into circulation. A lot of times people make new versions that do specific work for printing or for other applications, um, mainly better versions of color management, support for different types of spot colors and libraries, and ways of making sure that the images are always stable and repeatable when you print them. Uh, the PDF slash X is one of the best things for printing. The X1A is the preferred one, and that one does some of the best things for printing. It does a good job of managing transparency and raster effects when they show up, and it does a great job with spot color and non-normal CMYK color space objects. You go, PDFX. Now we're going to talk about one or two last things before we finish. The JDF, Job def de Definition Format. These are not print files. These are job management files. Uh, full disclosure, I have never worked at a print shop big enough to use this type of file to accompany a print file because I did not need to communicate file information to anyone else by being both the, not both, let's go through all of them, by being the graphic designer and the pre-press, uh, pre-flight technician and the output technician and the press operator, I did not need to send myself a file to tell me what I was using. Uh, and we did keep record on paper for this uh, of what jobs were being done and what the specifications were. But instead of having a printed sheet of paper job ticket that people fill out with a pen on paper, although I do kind of enjoy that, uh, the JDF is a way of digitally sending along information from one station to another in a job. So if you're in a big enough print shop, this lets the different teammates communicate about the job. Little notes saying, hey, make sure you watch out. They like this blue, but it never quite works. And they're always picky, but they're not willing to do it for spot color. That would show up in the JDF. And if it says, hey, watch out, there's uh, not enough trim space on this thing, but you gotta do it anyways, that lets the guys in binary know that they gotta be cautious on this one. And you can add to it, you can look at it, you can always make changes. It's a way of collaborating across a large company with a lot of teammates. Uh, they're XML based, they make it really easy to send the information from place to place. You can communicate back through JDF to the original person saying, hey, uh, what did you mean by that note? And you can track the job and see where it is in the process, which is good because clients always want to know how their job is currently doing. It's an industry specification as well. It's been developed by a bunch of different print companies together. And you can look up through the SIP4 organization to see what the specific versions are currently out there. And if you want to become a member, they're open to it. Thank you.